house better call somebody Hey, yo, it's me, it's me, the R to the P, and yes, you better call somebody and tell them that the Old Culture Podcast has new merch. Finally! 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 Yes, finally, more than 20 items in stock at oldculturepodcast.com slash merch. Slap that sigil on your chest like a Superman or Wonder Woman and spread the message of infinite love, truth, and awareness. Both unisex and women's fits now available in a slew of different styles, including high-quality American apparel, tees, tanks, crop tops, hoodies, and long sleeves, plus designs that show off your wokeness, and hats for the alchemist deep within you because we are on a mission to make America great again. (laughs) Oh, no, Donald, you silly fuck. That's make alchemy great again. So transmute your wardrobe from lead to gold and conjure up oldculturepodcast.com slash merch. And you know what? Do that now and use coupon code EQUINOX and enjoy 10% off on all orders from now through the fall EQUINOX. That's now through Sunday, September 23rd. You gotta be fucking kidding. Nah, dude, I'm not. I've labored for far too long on this to let this merch just sit around 10% off through Sunday, September 23rd with the coupon code EQUINOX at oculturepodcast.com slash merch. That's through the web store, not the Etsy shop. So follow the link in the show notes and manifest your heart's desire for some new swag because what fun is casting spells and summoning spirits without cozy ritual attire? So culturepodcast.com slash merch, use the coupon code Equinox, that's E-Q-U-I-N-O-X, and get 10% off all orders for the rest of the summer. Now let's drop that needle and roll that intro. Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where we are a bit refreshed after a week of doing absolutely nothing. Actually, that's a lie. I was quite busy on vacay, but in the best possible way, on the road, road tripping as they say, and just kicking it with some of that electric relaxation, as my boys ATCQ would say. Anyway, I am Ryan Peverly, your host of this here house party, and our guest this time around is Aiden Walker, talismanic jewelry maker and author of the recently released Six Ways, Approaches and Entries for Practical Magic, which is the basis for our conversation here today. This book really struck me in some field spots as I was reading through it, and you will hear a bit about why and how it did that. Six Ways is a handbook of practical sorcery and magic, as Aiden knows and works it. He says that magic and sorcery have many definitions, and we'll have many more as we move as a species forward through time. The basic idea is that there are ways of being and interacting in the world that allow for certain kinds of communication, the production of change on both internal and external levels, and the development of what could be called special skills and talents. These are psychic powers or arts in the old usage of the word, meaning that these are relative to the soul, spirit, and mind, and these arts of soul, spirit, and mind come down to us in various ways. They come as full-blown systems of magic or witchcraft, as religious practices, as shamanry, as Aiden calls it, or as tales and ideas surviving via folklore, song, and literature. And if you've been listening to the show here for a while, it should come as no surprise that that description, which comes directly from Aiden's book, is firmly my jam, as the older kids like to say. So let's rock out to it, shall we? And let's welcome Aiden Walker into the house. Enjoy. So Aiden Walker, welcome to O Culture, man. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. So you are the author of... Recently published book, Six Ways, Approaches, and Entries for Practical Magic. Now, I hate to say this, but you've been doing (laughs) magic for longer than I've been alive. And we have to go back (laughs) 
We have to go back to the beginning and set the scene for everybody. It's 1982. Members only jackets are in. The Commodore 64 has just been released. E.T. and Tron are selling out movie theaters across the world. And a young Aiden Walker is about to have his life changed. So if you don't mind, please do tell us the story all about how your life got flipped and turned upside down during that fateful year of 1982. Sure. So in 82, I was 15. Things had been weird before then, and I knew that I was a little bit freaky, but I didn't have any kind of framework for it. And I was a punk. My friend, a friend of mine had got me into punk rock, older friend. So there was like my friend, crew of punk friends. We were kind of the ridiculous. We were into what we were into, and we didn't really care about what how it was supposed to be. So like there was a point where I got interviewed in a newspaper, and they were at that time that they were really looking for it to be way more political than it was. And we were just like, nah, this is just like, cool. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we think the universe, the kind of adult universe is really stupid. And this is a really good kickback to it. And so this was mostly me, a couple of friends from school, and then a number of guys that were my brother's age, a few old, a few years older than me. And uh, we used to hang out in this kind of like Denny's-esque coffee shop, huge coffee shop that was mostly food and families. And we were just the obnoxious loud kids in the corner chain smoking cigarettes and drinking endless cups of coffee and not being good customers at all (laughs) but there was another crew of kind of weirdos that were in there but we never talked to them but they were a little they were uh not as overtly spastic as we were and one day they dropped off a book of matches at our table as they walked out the door and uh, my friend aaron picked it up and then showed it to me and opened it up and it said do you want to talk and had a phone number and so he and i called them and they invited us over one evening and uh, we went over to their house and they were punks, but they were into all this music that I'd never heard and were way more conscious of a lot of shit that I was, it had never really come across, you know? So like one of the guys there was a little bit older than most of them and he was into Tai Chi and I think Aikido and was a magician. And that was cool. I had some interest in that stuff, but I'd never found anything that kind of gelled you know, at 15 shopping in the mall and stuff like that out in the suburbs. I'd read a couple things, but nothing really clicked. And then they put on this record called Force the Hand of Chance by this band called Psychic TV. And that was the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. And so uh, we hung out with them and, and you know, kind of became friends that night. And uh, I think the next week I went, this is out in the deep East Bay, Contra Costa County. I took the BART train into Berkeley and found a copy of that record. And it totally blew my mind. And one of the things was really interesting was they had this strange soundtrack album that comes with that record on vinyl. The first one is actual songs. Psychic TV themes is like um, kind of ritual music, trance music. And uh, they also said that you could write them for more information and send them a few bucks and an international reply coupon. And so we did that, and that's how we got a hold of the Gray Book, which was their kind of intro handbook. This is how you do magic the way that we suggest and become a part of the temple. And so it was mainly kind of continued contact with the ceremonial magician that I met that night. And then the the topi stuff that started my having a kind of more coherent interest in magic. Like, okay, maybe this is the thing that I'm looking for. Well... We have something in common. You said you were 15 when that happened. I was 15 once too, and I went through a punk phase as well around that age. But I think your punk and my punk might have been different. What were you growing up on? Because I'll tell you what I was growing up on. Things like Bad Religion. I don't know the timeline there if they were out when you were listening to it. But Bad Religion, groups like Pennywise, they came later. Black Flag. I don't know if Black Flag was punk. Yeah, I guess Black Flag was punk. Black Flag was punk, but at least it was certainly they got pretty wild. Yeah, for me, the first wave was kind of Avengers and the Damned, the Stranglers, Dead Kennedys, TSOL, Seven Seconds, Circle Jerks. So yeah, like the first show I ever went to that was a punk show was Dead Kennedys and TSOL with Seven Seconds playing, Bad Brains, all that good stuff. And then I kind of flipped out of that after I met the industrial dudes because I was just like, this is so weird. I'm going to track down all of this weird kind of art damaged noise shit and see, <laughs> see what it yeah. does to my head. But I was definitely interested in that. I was like, what, what's actually changing me? So I kind of fell out of the hardcore scene within a couple of years. 
So you got into the industrial stuff? Did you get into things like ministry or some other bands? That's later. So this was like Psychic TV, Throbbing Gristle, SPK, like Zev, Non, and then Current 93, early Current 93 stuff. And that, again, that, that kind of phase lasted for a few years, and then I kind of fell out of that because at heart I'm a total rocker, so I, I, I wanted something that was kind of balls out. So Definitely. went more into you know, Sonic Youth Swans, uh, yeah. Jesus Lizard, Tad, that kind of stuff. You are taking me back, man. Those are some great things, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so speaking of taking us back, let's go back to actually even earlier in your youth. Uh, I was reading through your book, obviously, and you mentioned in there that you had some interesting dream experiences as a child. Uh, you said you met the men in black in a dream when you were like 11. When I was what? 11, yeah. Yeah. What did you make of those kinds of experiences, those kinds of dreams at such a young age? Most of that stuff was really terrifying. I had pretty extensive sleep paralysis, which for anybody that hasn't had it, is, is a really weird thing where you're asleep, but you're kind of conscious of something happening to you, but you can't move and you can't wake up. And so kind of my method for dealing with sleep paralysis was that I could attempt to kind of like shake myself enough that I could kind of scream myself awake. And so I did a lot of that as a kid. And so a lot of those experiences were more just terrifying than thinking anything of them at that time. Uh, even the man in black experience, I didn't have kind of words for it for about another 10 years. Uh, and I was reading some of the kind of accounts of the meetings with the men in the, the the man in black or the black man at the crossroads and went, oh, this is what that was. That totally makes sense because things began really shifting. That's when I kind of I think I woke up to just a different perception of how the world was. But yeah, mostly just pure terror. <laughs> it wasn't fun. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, did you even have any sort of framework for what the men in black were at that age? Well, the men in black experience, I did actually have something that I qualify as a men in black experience. But the man in black experience, no, not at all. It wasn't until I started reading kind of tale like witch trial stuff where they start talking about what happened. I met the, the, the black man at the crossroads and he did whatever, you know, and and gave me powers or whatever. And that's the point where I went, oh, maybe that's what actually happened there. That was kind of solidified. I had one encounter with him later that was very conscious and wide awake. But it was like more than 10 years later that that happened. So, yeah, I had no context for it. I, that's really, I think, why I started looking when I did meet the the magician that I knew. And, and uh, I met a, my friend Sam, uh, who was a witch, uh, at about that same time or a couple of years later. That I just kind of had the feeling that they had, they knew something that was going to be useful to me in kind of processing the stuff that was going on. So I have an interesting question that I've never asked anybody, but I've thought about it myself because I start to notice this pattern in my own dreaming. It ties back to our conversation about music and the types of music that you were into. Have you noticed a pattern where, like, say you were in your punk phase, your dreams were a certain way, and then when you switched over to maybe the more industrial phase or whatever you're into now even, have you noticed that what sort of kind of art or music that you're immersing yourself in, that it shapes the context of your dreams at all? No, I mean, not really. The only thing that I could say is I, you know, as, as being a kind of road warrior freak as a kid too, that kind of scenario was present for about 10 years. And I don't really see that anymore, but this definitely kind of road warrior-esque post-apocalyptic scenario. A lot of it ended up being uh, the kind of the dreams that were super relevant there were, were kind of unlike anything I'd ever seen. So I had a, a whole period of dreams kind of as I was getting into hands-on magic that involved kind of finding myself in kind of a Pacific Northwest rainforest kind of zone. But if you've been in those kind of super spongy, mossy rainforests like you're walking on the ground and it gives like it's alive anyway because it's so thick with moss and it's so soft with you know pine needles and tree duff and all that stuff and so I was in those spaces a lot and seeing that like what was underneath the moss was like an incredible depth and kind of width that the whole forest was filled with um like organs like human and animal organs but it wasn't gory it was just like this was you know now i can kind of think of it i haven't thought of this in years so thank you for asking but i could kind of see like that was perhaps i mean that that fits in with six ways a lot <laughs> image wise <laughs> yeah. uh and kind of my experience of the world as being this large organic thing on both sides 
And that was a really common place that I was in for a long time. But yeah, I don't, I, I don't think it was super cultural, like pop culturally affected. Yeah, I've just noticed like I cycle through these phases of music just in my own, you know, day to day where I'll get into punk for a week or two and then I'll go into hip hop for a week or two. And I just notice like my dreams are different when I'm listening to certain types of music. Or I could also apply that to what you were talking about, like watching certain types of films or TV shows or reading certain types of books. Even right. I just may have allowed myself to be more susceptible to that sort of influence subconsciously, maybe. I'm not really sure how it's working, but I just thought that was an interesting question to ask. It is an interesting on, thing. Yeah. And I can see that, yeah, I think that there's probably like phases in my youth that I know there were influences from like the kind of earlier David Cronenberg films, like things were a little bit body freaky and uh, <laughs> not necessarily gory or anything, but just that kind of strangeness was present more than it is now, definitely. Whereas now things are strangely mundane seeming on the front of the dreaming end, but quite intense underneath, <laughs> which is more like my life, I guess. So. Well, Body Freaky is a good way to describe Cronenberg films for sure. So before we get into the book, you know, I hit it around it. I just have one more question for you. You're maybe most well known for making what you call talismanic jewelry. I'm sure there's a great story behind how that got started. So I guess how did that talismanic jewelry operation get started then? I decided at one point in 92, we believe, asking one of the younger people that was present, because those of us that were older don't truly remember, and she swears it was 92. I moved to New Orleans, and I met a jeweler named Mark DeFreitz and his wife, Pamela Daly, and we became super close friends. At that point, I was on the verge of leaving the IOT. What's the IOT for people who don't know what you're talking about? Oh, uh, the Illuminates of Theneteros. It's a chaos magic thing, order, whatever we call it that I was in for a few years. And so uh, Mark was was making really beautiful uh, symbolic jewelry, not kind of doing what I'm doing, but uh, some pagan stuff, a lot of queer stuff, you know, some kind of yoga derived stuff, ohms and stuff like that. But he had been a magician in his youth when he was in college in England and uh, university in England. And it ended up becoming a Tibetan Buddhist. And when we met one of the things that was interesting to both of us was kind of looking at his experience of the Buddhist stuff and my take on the more KOist side of magic. And we ended up forming a group called the Z Cluster, which is still around, which is a super freeform chaos magic thing. And I just, I visited New Orleans for periods of, you know, nine months that first time and then six months later and six months again. And on the last time I visited, uh, I began working with him, just kind of doing polishing and packaging and the grunt work while well, he was doing the cool stuff. And I learned how to make jewelry from him. I did that for a couple of years until I lost access to a place to do it in 99 and then came back to it in 2012. Well, that's a pretty big gap there. So tell people exactly what talismanic jewelry is, you know, like what you do with it and how they can best interact with it. Right. So my interest in jewelry has always been coupled with my interest in sorcery, you know, coming from kind of the Austin Spare influenced background. I'm heavily into sigil magic in a few kind of peculiar ways that for me merged with spirit magic at some point. And uh, when I started making jewelry again, I realized that what I wanted to do was really combine those two things into a single, I don't know what you call it, thing. Uh, <laughs> thing is the word for today. Uh, and so my interest is really explicitly in making jewelry that will be used by magicians for magical work. And so, you know, I'm doing this recording in my shop, which is this tiny little shop that is half filled with kind of my actual outright magical supplies and materia and working shrines. And then the other half is actually for jewelry production. And so it's it's a totally integrated thing because again I, I think that they're for me they're the same process. Talismanic on the end is as I think of it is like something that holds power or is a key or a gate to something else to open up something else or to pass through to something else or to draw something through. And so to me the talisman is kind of the the root material base of whatever we're working with. So even if we're doing with something a religious item like a piece for Hecate or a piece for, you know, Woden or something like that. That thing is a point of, of connection to that spirit if it's used right. And to me, part of that is if it's made right. So 
I try and do that side so somebody else can then kind of finish waking that thing up on their end uh, and have it be a useful tool for the work that they do. Yeah. What sort of materials do you use? Sterling silver only, a little bit of fine silver, um, and very occasionally I'll add a little bit of copper. I used to do gold, but I found that I really didn't like it working with it very much, so I don't do gold anymore. So sterling silver, is that a bit more, I don't know, conducive to the magic then? I think it is. Uh, you know, silver is the most electrically conductive metal, and sterling is an interesting combo because it's 92.5% pure silver, and the balance is copper. So it's, again, kind of a super conductive and a nice blend of that kind of lunar and, and uh, Venusian ener energies if we're using kind of traditional correspondences for that stuff. Yeah, to me, it's just re it takes a it takes on life better than anything else other than like wood or bone. You know, if, that, if I wasn't doing it in silver, I'd be doing wood or bone things. It's uh, I don't know why the silver has as organic of a vibe as those things do to me, but it definitely does. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, for people who haven't seen your, you know, like what you do, it's very impressive. It's very sort of ornate and intricate talismans. And, you know, getting into the book now, you know, Six Ways, I'm curious about what led you to write this, because there are probably thousands of introductory texts to magic. But you did say in your preface to it that you wanted to fill some sort of gap. So what was that gap that needed filled, you think? To me, I don't view magic as explicitly a religious process. I think it can. It, it absolutely is for a lot of people. I and mean, I have no issue with that. But for me, that's not the deal. And then kind of on the other side of that, there's the kind of hyper materialist take on magic that this is all happening in our brains. We're using this to modify our psychology in some way that then changes things around. And I also don't entirely disagree with that. I think there's a lot of magic that is like that. And I think that all functional magic does have that effect as well. As I started writing it, I was like, what do I, what, what would I have liked to have come across? Or even now, what, what, what would be interesting to me is to see someone that is able to kind of express to some degree what they do as a day-to-day -day thing. And then the why behind it, not the theory, but like having done it for enough time, why does that seem to work pretty well? And so it's pretty, you know, it's, I, I tried to get it as, as little theory as possible. And it's also... I made no attempt to make it objective. You know, it's like, I'm not going to claim that this is valid for everybody or that it's the right way or that this is the secret or anything like that. I wanted to really have it be something that somebody could use to, to figure out their own path. I wasn't trying to, I don't present it as a system. It's got a lot of pieces, but they're not built that way. They're just the things that have worked really consistently for myself and for the other people I've had try them over the years. So to me, that was the main thing was really like, how can we get this to be as useful to someone at wherever they're at? And to me, that was being as open as I could about what I do and, and why and the pieces that seem really important, even if I don't know why they're really important, which is a lot of them. There's way more in there that I couldn't tell you why you have, why I think you should do it that way if you're going to play <laughs> uh, or at least try it and see how it works. Then I could tell you why I think it works. And so that was the big thing is I wanted it to be really uh, useful for anyone at any level. I didn't want somebody to have to kind of dive into uh, a study of occultism to use it. So I wanted it to be as I wanted it to be enough that somebody could really go, OK, I'm just going to run with this for a few years and explore from these places that he's allowing has, has shown me ways into. And so far, that seems to be working for people. Yeah, I think. Uh... You mentioned that you need the internal reasoning and application. That's really important to you. And that's why you sort of wrote the book, too. And then you also said something about developing or remembering the sorceress worldview. What do you mean by that exactly? So I look at, you know, human history as an extremely long view. Like, you know, currently we're saying that somewhere we'll just say more than a million years, human type people, our ancestors have been more or less like us. And so when I look at that and I look at kind of modern civilization and the things that have come out of modern civilization, which is mostly what we have records of, that whole modern civilization thing is this teeny, tiny, tiny fucking blip. That's maybe it's like the switch is halfway turned on. It's like it hasn't even turned on or something. When you walk into the room, that's your day. It's like the hands on it and it's beginning to move. And so I Looking at that and then looking at kind of what we have anthropologically and various other kind of studies of things of what do people who are not fully civilized do that we know of and what did they do 
spiritually, magically, shamanically, if we want to use that in a general term, not in the necessarily specifics. And to me, I see so much similarity in all that stuff. The faces on it change, right? The different masks that it wears change. But looking at that, you go, okay, everybody, every human culture that we can see at one point did this thing that we think of as uh, magical, shamanic, again, in the general sense, or sorcery, as their kind of base interaction with the world at large. And so to me, that indicates that that's in us in a way that you can't get it out. And so if you kind of can remember that for you personally and whatever that is, you don't need a ton of outside kind of instruction or data. Uh, It's something that you can tap into. It's like, you know, it's not in the ESP sense, but it is, it's like another sense that if you can turn on, then there's just a massive amount of information available to you and tools available to you. So to me, that's the remembering. It's not like a learning thing because it's in the body. It's like a, it's like learning to walk, right? We're in a culture. It's as if we were in a culture that no longer taught us to walk, right? We would individually have trouble learning to walk, but it's, it's, it's sitting within us latent for a very long time. Yeah. You know, a couple million years down the road, we may not have that ability anymore, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's just sitting there. Definitely. And one point you also made up front in the book was that even if you don't find any use for the particular set of beliefs or philosophies embedded in things like grimoires or books on traditional witchcraft, that these texts right. may still hold value as literature. I found that statement pretty curious because, I mean, well, I guess personally I view any text as literature, but the average reader of a magical text may not consider them to be that. So I'm just wondering if you could explain what you mean exactly by literature, because that word can be tricky to define sometimes. Totally. Uh, my friend Halliday actually sent this to me in a letter about six years ago, that comment, and it <laughs> it kind of threw me for a loop because he and I both read a fair amount of magical texts, but we don't take them as seriously as some people do. Not in the sense that we don't take them seriously, but I don't have to be convinced by anything that I read to find use in it. It doesn't have to be right, you know, so... Uh, it's kind of like uh, you know, a great example of that on the pop culture side or more pop culture side is Carlos Castaneda. Uh, most of us that have dug into that goes, okay, that guy made all that shit up. Um, <laughs> but it's yeah. still very useful. There's a ton of good shit in there. And uh, so by being able to pick up, you know, the, the sworn book of Honorius or a religious text or, yeah, a, a book on witchcraft or Wicca or whatever, if you're just reading it going, okay, I'm just reading this book. Uh, I'm reading it to see what it says. I don't need to tear it apart. I don't need to uh, agree with it. I don't need to buy their worldview. I can just literally read it like I read Moby Dick and let what good bits come into me the same way as what happens when I'm reading Moby Dick, William Burroughs, whatever else, you know. I think people take, at least the those who like to fight about such things, take it way too seriously for my interest. I don't And some of my early influences are decidedly bastardization and appropriation, you know, whether that's Castaneda or Max Freedom Long's Huna stuff, stuff that I came along into very early. Yeah, it's not legit transmission of what really happened in those cultures, but it's absolutely useful and absolutely entertaining. And that's totally good for me. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty cool point that you made there with that quote. And uh, I would agree with it, you know. I don't know if I take everything I read about magic and the occult seriously, but at the very least, it's entertaining and I do find some value in it. So while we're defining terms, I have a couple more that I'd like to throw out. The first one, what is the field? To me, the field is, and I think I define it in the book this way, but more or less, is is the the sum total of manifest and unmanifest reality. And I kind of use that term partially because of the the actual concept of an organic field, like a, like a meadow kind of field, and that there's all this stuff that is potential in that meadow. You know, there are potentials of trees, there's potentials of just vast layers of stuff. And they're all sitting there as that potential until whatever trigger occurs that causes them to actually come into manifestation. Like that meadow over time may become a forest or it may become an ocean. And all of that stuff is lying dormant in that space. And that was the best way I could kind of describe my perception of what's going on in the world magically is 
things do come apparently out of nowhere. So they have to be latent somewhere, right? And so that's why manifest and unmanifest. And then playing with magic for a very long time, I got struck with a really persistent idea that yeah, there's spirits. Yes, there's our kind of mental constructs or psychological things and emotional constructs. There's astral bodies that, or, you know, heavenly bodies that may have influences and there's plants and materia and stones and things that may have influences. And so the, we kind of accept in most forms of magic, I think that whether we truly believe in any of those things, we can work with them to affect the changes we're after. I believe that the field is the other major component to that, that the actual structure of what we're existing in, either manifest or not yet manifest, is also amenable to work, that you can work directly with the field to bring about what you're, what you're sh shooting for. And you also define magic or sorcery as the art of communication with this field and its inhabitants, right? Absolutely. Yeah, because I think that that's what we're, to me, I'm, I mean, I'm a spirit worker. I absolutely, I fought it for a long time, but that was my root experiences and all this stuff was interaction, which uh, yeah, I didn't know it at the time. But later I went, okay, those are the spirits that people are talking about. That's what was going on. And I had spirit possession experiences and things like that that were quite severe. And to me, that's the game of magic is can we actually get into uh, an interactive two-way communication, uh, reciprocal as of the other term I use a lot in the book, is symbiotic relationship with all those other things. So the field itself and the other things that are not exactly like us, but are willing to play with us, which is, you know, the spirits or others. Yeah. And I also suppose it makes sense to tell folks what the six ways actually are as well. Sure. So the six ways, the book kind of decided it was going to get named that. And the cover image was something that came to me about 10 days before I started the book, before I knew that the book was going to be there. The Six Ways is a, a descriptor of uh, the directions that I took from Daniel Brand Griffith's book. And I will not remember the name of it without looking it up, but it's, I think, the stag, the three nails of the Six Ways, something along those lines, which is the image that's on the cover is of three arrows crossed. And this is the four directions in the zone above and below. And so it's essentially kind of, that was the simplest map that I've found useful. Like you can get away more complex than that, but if you don't have at least those elements, I find it difficult to work. Okay. And so let's get into more of the practical aspect of the book, you know, and perhaps the most important aspect of magic or sorcery to me anyway, is your intention and your focus. So what sort of advice would you have for people when setting intentions and clarifying focus? <laughs> the things that nobody ever wants to hear. Meditation is good. Coming up with a with some method to get clear on your on, on ourselves and the drivers and influences on us is kind of step one for me. It doesn't mean you can't start working, but I would include that work as the work because if we're trying to make change in the outer, which is what I'm interested in as well as the inner, which is what I kind of qualify as practical magic, is stuff that's actually changing our lives in a in a tangible way. In my experience, it has to sync up with who we are. If we can use it to change who we are to what who, to who we would rather be in some ways, but we have to know where we are. We, we you got to have a starting point. You know, if if I I was thinking about this last night actually, and I was thinking about it like chess pieces on a chessboard, right? So we've got this grid, and if I know that I'm a queen sitting in the middle, I know that I can go in a straight line anywhere, right? I can get to any place on that board in a pretty direct fashion. But if I think that I'm the queen, but I'm the bishop and I have this massive constraint on how I can move, I'm going to be just continuously frustrated because I just don't have that option. I can't, if I'm on, if I'm a bishop on black, I can't get to white, right? Uh, that's not available. And so that first step of kind of focus and intention is like, where are we really? If I want to be you know, a rock star, or if I want to be really wealthy, or if I want to be a basketball player, where am I in relationship to that right now is kind of step one. And so to me, that's a huge portion. I talk about that kind of thing in the book quite a bit is, can you figure out where you are now so you know what that next step is, so that you know if like there's no way you're getting to white, then what else works for you? What's the next acceptable thing since that one's not actually happening? 
and then for focus, it's just, yeah, it's just being really clear. Like what's, what's not what's obviously possible. Cause I think we can do a lot of stuff that's not obviously possible, but kind of coming from Jason Miller's approach, like what are the logical steps we can do both on the mundane to support this? If I want to be, you know, sadly, if I want to be a basketball player, I would have needed to have different parents. But uh, if I wanted to be rich, how much do I want that? Do I want that enough to go into the lines of work that tends to lead to that and live the kind of life that tends to lead to that? I can absolutely use magic to make those things, each each step work better. And so I think that that's, the, that's kind of the root thing is just being like really honest, like where, what, do, what is the thing that I want? And is it is there a path? Can I, can I make a path even if I have to make it, which is a lot of what magic is, is how do we make that path? It, one of the ways I was talking about a friend with it is um, kind of in Buddhism, we get this idea that everything that arises comes from what tends to get referred to in some texts as causes and conditions, right? These are the things that allowed whatever current state we're in to arise. And so one view that I have of, of magic is Magic is also an art of generating causes and conditions to change our state. And again, I think that there's stuff you can, there's stuff you can do, and there's stuff that I don't think we know how to do. I'm not saying you can't, but I can't make myself, you know, seven inches taller and really fast at 51. That would have taken <laughs> uh, work much earlier in life uh, <laughs> in the zygote stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why weren't you doing magic back then, Aiden? Come on. Well, I really hate basketball, so it's all right. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then, why do you care then? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I really like this thing that you said in the book, too. You don't want to take the guided tour. And the guided tour is any sort of tradition or practice, religion, yoga, magic, alchemy. But if you don't want the guided tour, what sort of traveling are you doing then? How are you seeing the landscape? Well, I view this as kind of the tour bus in the in the book, and I think that that's and I like that metaphor because if we go to you know uh, if I go to Italy and I take the tour bus, I'm going to maybe have five or six or ten options of where that can take me, and we could flip this out to magic being you know Goetia, traditional witchcraft, Wicca, Golden Dawn, Thelema, uh, as being like those individual tour buses. And what I really mean is not that you can't use them, but you need to be aware that they're only going to take you to certain places. And at some point you got to decide whether that's still working for you or whether it was ever working for you. And if it's not, again, it's that clarity of kind of focus. Like, does this go where I want it to go? I eventually hit the place with magical orders where I went, no, none of these things go where I want to go. It's not that they're bad. It's just, I have a different interest. So for me, where that's really relevant is in trance work and spirit work. I like to be able to get into what I call the other worlds and go look around. I don't want somebody to say, you enter this space and it's blue and you're, there's three stars in the sky and you're going to connect with blah, blah, blah. Nothing wrong with it. Totally excellent way to get started, actually. But for me, I really was like, what happens if I just go to the crossroads and hang out? What if I go to the crossroads and sit for six months? I don't try and make anything happen. What happens then? Does anything happen? If it doesn't, can I then change that just slightly? Can I go to the crossroads in trance and say, I want to meet an ally that will help me and assist me with this. What happens then? In my experience, that ally will come in time, but it requires a lot of patience. And what happens then is you end up working, for me at least, I end up working in a kind of purely organic state. And what I think is going on, I don't like making kind of general statements too much, but so I'll say that everybody that I know that works magic has a group of allies that is that are, that is already around them. And we can kind of short circuit that sometimes if we aren't just open to it. Uh, if we go hunting, I need to find a powerful spirit that will help me do X. Well, have you talked to your people? Have you gone into whatever state that is, whether that's a trance state or a divinatory state or just work magic and see if it works? Do I have allies that are interested in me increasing my wealth or increasing my health or helping me find an appropriate lover instead of somebody who's a psychopath? <laughs> and to me, it's a much easier way because you're not trying to find that you're not trying to find that particular piece in a book somewhere in an outer system. 
that fits the mold close enough. Like, is finding treasure the same thing as becoming rich? That's a good question. There's a lot of spirits in the grimoires that are good at finding treasure. But I mean, well, you know, for me, my, I believe that my allies and my ancestors, they're already invested. They've already been there. I may have to do a lot of work to get connection to them. But in general, it's not a ton in my experience and of most people I know. Some people seem to have a pretty major block on spirit work. So, I mean, I don't know what to tell those people because that's how I work. Yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, that's where I go about the guided tour. You can do that if you want to, but just know to get off if it's not working. It's not like you're going to get something in the next degree that is going to change your world, I don't believe. So I wanted to circle back to something real quick. I meant to ask this after the last question, but I forgot. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned Buddhism a couple of times in the chat here. And also, I noticed at the end of the book, you had some some reading recommendations. And the first text was a Buddhist text. I forget the author. Or I, I can't pronounce her name anyways, but it's called Feeding Your Demons. Right, by Sultra Malion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So are you a Buddhist? Were you a Buddhist? I mean, where are you coming from with have, that school of thought? I have never been a Buddhist. I started looking into Buddhism... A long time ago and started looking at Tibetan Buddhism, which most of it is not really my deal. But then I kind of dropped into what they call Theravada Buddhism, which is kind of the early form. It's the things that the Buddha himself actually taught. It is kind of based on what they call the, I think, the Pali Canon, which is the actual teachings of the Buddha, not the things that came later. And that's where we get things like the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path and all that stuff. And what happened to me when I started looking at Buddhism is I began seeing a really useful map of human psychology. And you've read the book, so you know that I'm not super concerned about accuracy as far as whether these things are dead on true. But it works uh, that if we for me and for most people that I know that are willing to kind of look at that basic level Buddhist stuff, it's not an explanation of how your psychology works as much as it's a toolkit to how do you make it work better and how do you get into the driver's seat with your mind and with your experiences. And so, yeah, I love that aspect of Buddhism. And then that Feeding Your Demons book is just the, that's the bomb practice for dealing with major problems I've ever found. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I uh, ran across it and was like, oh, this sounds interesting. Let's try it and set up the two cushions and did that for the next 70 nights. And uh, it, it kicked my ass in a beautiful way. I, I think that that's the most that's the single most helpful tool that I've found from Buddhism. So you don't have to be a Buddhist at all to believe it, to use that one. It's just straight up practice. Well, yeah, it definitely is. I haven't read the book, but I have a, a friend who's uh, a, been practicing Vajrayana Buddhism for about 20 mm -hmm. years or so. And he recommended that book to me seriously just a couple of weeks ago prior to our chat here. I haven't picked it up yet, but he was telling me what it was about. And then I was reading a bit about it online too. And the way that he described it to me and the way that the people that I was reading the reviews of it, that they described it, it was very much, it did not seem Buddhist to me. It, it seemed psychological and it seemed also a little bit alchemical as well. I don't know if you would agree with that, but it came off to me like... Yeah, totally. Yeah, okay. Well, I think it's interesting when we go to the Tibetan Buddhist stuff, and I'm not a, you know, I'd send you to Jason Miller if you had questions about any of that stuff, because I'm not that deep into it. But I think it's really clear when we look at that stuff, that there's a massive level of uh, Bon shamanist influence. And I think that that one's really clear. You look at that and you go, no, that's a, that's a straight up sorcery practice, you know, more so than most things you ever come across in a book that's generally <laughs> not targeted to sorcerers. You go, that's yeah. a straight up sorcery practice. That's a massive power tool right there. Well, the more conversations I have with my friend about his Buddhist practice, the more that he is doing magic. It's just veiled in different language. So totally. Yeah. I got kind of interested in that stuff. There was many years ago, Richard Gere put together a kind of traveling museum exhibit of inner temple art and ritual objects from Tibetan Buddhism. And I spent probably five days at that thing when it was in San Francisco. I was living there at the time, going in kind of during the week when I could, when it, I knew it would be empty and hanging out with those things. And you go, this is straight up sorcery. This is there may be all sorts of other theory behind it, but when I'm hanging out with these Tonkas that have been hanging out in temples for hundreds of years, you're like, this is a, it's again, it, this is a massive power tool. This is like spiritual jackhammer. This is not mellow. This is not, let's read the symbols to get some kind of intellectual enlightenment from it. Like this is a power tool. Like if you spend enough time in front of this thing, it's going to crack you open whether you want it to or not, probably. And I think that that to me is kind of a, 
a critical aspect of magic. You know, another thing I find interesting about you is you're an animist. I haven't really mm-hmm. trudged too far down that path here on the show. It's come up in conversation a couple of times. But if you could, you know, tell people who may be unfamiliar with that what animism is and why you find it to be such a valuable framework or worldview. Mm-hmm. As I always throw out, I'm not at all the academic. So uh, my definition is not necessarily the one you'd find by the academics. Animism is the experience that everything that you can come in contact with in potential has an indwelling spirit or is a spirit. And so that could be the desk, that could be the rocks, that could be the trees, that could be an animal, that could be a forest, that could be taken to an extreme, it could be literally anything. I think most animists find that there's a degree of what I'm going to call the synthetic, the overly manufactured, where that's less true by a long shot. Like I don't really find most plastic things to have any kind of a spirit in them. But, you know, my guitar, yeah, absolutely. Uh, (laughs) And so animism from a magical practice is incredibly useful to me because it means we're surrounded by potential allies and potential information sources. And that to me is just gold. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know what else to say about that. That's like so it's like if you could be completely surrounded by just a vast community that is available to help or hinder, this gives you an incredible leg up on trying to make change through magical means, you know, because then you know that there's some things that want to assist and there's some things that might be in the way. And you might want to see if you can change that relationship with the ones that are in the way in some fashion, which to me is a, that's a, that's one of the missing keys that I also got from Jason Miller was really kind of dealing with the, can we, more or less bring the the things that are working against us to the table. So is that a belief system or a worldview that you find to be like, does it enhance your magical working or is it valuable for anybody regardless of if they're a practicing magician or not? To me, I really, my personal belief is that it's the root belief of, of, of humans because I think it's an experience of reality and that's, you know, kind of, Whatever, that's my take, and not everybody's going to agree with that. But, and I think it's just massively useful. Uh, I think you don't have to have a lot of belief to do magic, contrary to a lot of sources that suggest that that's the most important thing. I actually don't think it's particularly important. I think you have to not be working against yourself when you're doing magic. So you have to be at least open to things happening in a peculiar fashion. And to me, I realized that animism was just how I saw the world as I kind of stumbled across multiple streams it was a long time before i actually realized like oh that's the root behind all the stuff that makes sense to me is animism that that's the base experience Uh, and i think it's one that i've always had you know when it comes to animism i've always wondered and i think this is something you touch on in the book but you might not have i don't i don't recall exactly but i've always wondered if everything is imbued with spirit how do we reconcile just basic things like eating food you know like obviously there's a big kerfuffle around eating animals with the veganism movement but like what about plants right. like if they're sentient in some way or imbued with Which spirit there's, like, you know if we take the studies seriously on any of that stuff they are um, yeah so so how do you reconcile that i suppose i don't see them as being counter anyway one of the things that i think we got out of this shift into first into civilization and then kind of the weird deity structures and religious structures that come out of city states and all of that is kind of an unnatural relationship to death. And so, yeah, no, I mean, if, if, if I keel over in the yard, (laughs) I hope that my dogs eat me, you know, that would be great. Why would that be great to you? Um, Because it's, we're not allowed to go back into the food chain in America at this point. Right. You either get burned or you get buried mostly inside a concrete vault so that the ground doesn't collapse as the casket and you collapse it so that the lawnmower can more easily roll over the turf in the cemetery. And so you're basically going to turn to kind of liquid inside this concrete box. So you're totally useless. So, yeah, I'd much rather uh, that I be useful when I when I go. And so, yeah, it's, and, and to me, that's a food. It's, it's, we're in a cycle of food. Everything eats everything. I have chickens and they're, they're absolute carnivores. If you want to train chickens, just bring out some meat and they will follow you around for months after that because they remember and they love it. 
I think it's natural. I think that the way we do it right now is not natural for the most part. I think industrial farming in all of its forms is massively screwed up. And so I understand the the desire to get away from that, but I don't understand the even the I really don't even understand the concept of why eating other animals is bad because it's clearly going on at all levels. I don't know why we would consider ourselves to be exempt from that. That's like massive hubris. Yeah, I think it's a fair point, actually, the way that you described it. At first, it may sound like a bit, uh, well, what the fuck? Like, why would I want my body to be eaten? But now the way that you phrase it, it makes sense. And speaking of phrases... Nutrients another... back into the system. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Another phrase I liked in the book uh, was gut and bone. Sounds gritty, mm -hmm. maybe a bit punk rock, maybe a bit industrial, too. I love it. But what do you mean by that phrase, exactly? I think, it, for me... I'm extremely cerebral in many ways. I'm definitely, you know, as, as Jim Carroll says, some, says in one of his songs, too much head and not much heart. And I can go that route. It's not really true, but it's, and so for me, a lot of learning out how to do magic was to get my head out of the game. How do I actually sense what just feels right to me? So instead of trying to have correspondences for all of the herbs that are in the shop, you know, I know which ones I can't eat. I know which ones uh, you don't want to, if you ingest, you want to do it in very small quantities because otherwise you might die. <laughs> but I'm much more interested in the feel of, feel of it. And that's what the gut and bone thing is. My friend Fabiku calls it bone knowing. Like if you're, and I think of it sometimes doing like divination, like I could pull out some cards and, and lay them down and I could think about what does that card mean by any system of correspondences. And then I could tell myself a story about that. But if I don't hit some kind of a place of bone knowing of just like, yeah, that is what that is trying to tell me right now, then it's like having a conversation that I don't know that I really understood what the other person said. Like intellectually, I know what the words meant, but I don't know that that's what they meant to say, you know? And so gut and bone to me is about, can we each individually find uh, that connection to, to maybe like legitimate gnosis, like, actual knowing that is real for you and that isn't just fucked up by all the filters that we have running all the time and yeah it's a it's a can we kind of see behind all of those filters or through all of those filters and actually hit something that you just go yeah this is right i don't have i don't give a fuck what crowley or anybody else says about whether i uh do this this way this is the information i'm being given this is the, the path i'm following and i know it's right well, I think getting to that stage or that point is extremely difficult in our modern environment. And hell yeah. Yeah, this kind of <laughs> this kind of uh it kind of ties in with a question I wanted to ask later, but I'll ask it now. And I've asked it a couple times recently to some other people, but you have a bit in the book about staying clean. And it's mm -hmm. always ma it's always made sense to me that you'd want to be the cleanest version of yourself you could be if you were venturing into magical waters. Like I'm thinking of that more on the cellular level now for myself, like not only being in good physical mm -hmm. condition, but being in good sort of cellular condition, which is difficult, you know, getting to that point, especially with all these toxins in our environment, like I just sort of alluded to. Right. And that's not to mention the psychological and emotional component to this, you know, being clean there as well. So I guess I'm wondering, like, is this what you meant when you said stay clean in the book? That whole sort of like a holistic thing? Or was it just, you know, take a shower every now and then, guys? Yeah, it's it's both. A lot of the stuff that I think kind of gets in our way of achieving what we want magically is what in hoodoo they call crossed conditions, right? And really, that's any kind of blockage that has occurred. It could be you can have done it to yourself. You could have walked through, you know, coming from my world, you could have pissed off the local land spirit. And anyway, now there's there there's actual things that are hindering you from achieving what you want. And so kind of step one and stay clean is like spiritual hygiene straight up. Uh, you know, I, I, two of the books in that pretty brief reading list are on spiritual hygiene in the book. And that's one of those things that outside of kind of hoodoo and the ATRs doesn't get put forward enough in ways that really work, I think. You know, so like I did seven years straight of doing banishing rituals twice a day and they did great shit for me but um as far as this thing no taking a shower once a week with some salt and some rosemary and sage and hyssop as a pour over bath afterwards would have done a hell of a lot more than the lvr ever did uh on that level but yeah i mean there's a subtext in, in in that chapter that is exactly what you're hinting at which is you know you got to take care of yourself on all levels you know are you as well as you could be 
you know, at least within reason. I'm not hyper about any of that stuff. But yeah, do you eat in a way that is working for your body? Do you move around in a way that is working for your body? Are you keeping your mind clear through meditation or something like that enough that you're not working at cross purposes to yourself? And, you know, we could extrapolate in a very strange way to say like, yeah, if you are otherwise healthy, you don't have anything kind of keeping you from it, but you choose not to move in a way that is kind of keeping your body working well and you eat like total shit in a way that's a crossed condition that you are doing to yourself on a daily basis. And if you can get those things, you know, we could kind of use the the popular in the modern age, the, the 80-20 rule, right? If you can get 80% of that stuff nailed down, yeah, then the 20% that's left over is probably not causing you a lot of harm. And on the averse side of that, the benefit that you get from doing a little bit of that kind of work is huge. It doesn't have to be that you have to become an athlete, that you have to become a vegan or paleo or anything like that. Just, yeah, can you minimize your exposures? Can you minimize your damage and get your, yeah, get get your whole scenario clear? You know, clear might be better than clean, just so that you can actually see where you're at and, and have your mind in your own hands and your body in your own hands to the degree that you can. You just segue nicely into the next part of the chat here because getting clear is difficult for me at times. I know it's difficult for a lot of people. And I guess I'm talking about this in terms of silence, finding that silence that you need to work on yourself. And if you're a magician, you know, to work with your magic. I try to meditate, but sometimes it just doesn't take, you know, like I can't get quite into that (laughs) space where I'd like to be. Yeah. (laughs) So what sort of advice do you have on how to best get to that space to find that silence? You know, humorously, the the things we just said are all helpful. You know, again, if we look at the long view of humanity, we're meant to be moving around a lot. We're meant to be picking up some fairly heavy shit and moving it around. We're meant to be at least walking a lot. I think that that when they looked at hunter-gatherers in general, uh, just worldwide, that you know, as they started looking at this stuff, that most of those people walked between six and 12 miles a day every day. So yeah, to me, like the physical practice is huge. I can't meditate for shit if I'm not working out in some fashion. Uh, You know, I really like it. I'm one of those people that's, that kind of requires it to be well. So I do a lot more than is actually needed for most people because it works for me. But yeah, I mean, are you walking? Are you eating pretty well? Are you not over caffeinated? Are you, you know, I just, my wife finally got on me enough to get me to take weekends off, uh, which I hadn't done in a long time because I got quite behind in the shop. And now I'm way more efficient and I'm happier and I'm clearer and I can meditate better (laughs) because I actually have some breaks from the work, right? Yeah. All these things that are kind of, we all know, but we don't do. And then for me, transinduction was my key into meditation. Because again, I'm super cerebral and my brain fucking go, loves to chatter nonstop. That discursive mind is just a nonstop sea of bullshit. And the other thing that's really important for people, I think that especially are new to this stuff is it's not like that goes away for most people. Like that may go away for, you know, high level llama or something because all they're doing is working to control it. But for the rest of us that are actually kind of living semi-normal lives, it never stops. And so what we're really looking for is like, are there ways to turn it down, get a few minutes, you know? And so, yeah, I think, you know, exercise, some basic meditation, some people freak out from meditation, in which case it's probably not helpful. But if you just find it boring and and difficult, that's, you're doing it right. (laughs) So I would worry about that. And yeah, I mean, just obvious stuff. I can really easily slip into massive social media addiction and rooting around on YouTube and <laughs> yeah. uh, Googling 8 million articles I'm interested in reading. And that's not really good for my overall state of mind. So it's better for me to have kind of a, a focused time to do that. All that shit helps. I think it's pretty basic overall. Definitely. Yeah. And your point about you're taking weekends off now is uh, it resonates with me because I've recently started to do some of the same thing. You know, I have a full-time job in addition to the podcast here. So Mm -hmm. I've overworked myself for months now. And I've just finally got to the point where I'm like, you know, I need to make more time for me. I need to make more time for my relationships with other people. And Mm -hmm. since I've been doing that, it's been a conscious effort for not very long, maybe a month now. And I have found a tremendous benefit to it already where I, I just feel less stressed. I'm losing weight. I'm being healthier, getting healthier. Finding that zone that I need to be in, you know, mentally and emotionally for my meditation as well. So, yeah, it's a good practical bit of advice. It has nothing to do with magic, really, to just 
take some time for yourself. And then, you know, if you are, I guess, operating in those environments, that it's going to benefit you in those environments as well. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think right now it's like, you know, we're in a culture of total distraction. And so you have to come up with a, a mitigation strategy, I think, if you're a magician, which doesn't work really well when you're distracted. So whether whatever that is, whether it's using like, you know, focus or the focus app or is what I use on my computer. So it's like I shut off my access to social media, except for, you know, 15 minute periods a couple times a day, you know, not bringing the computer into the shop so that I don't have the option of doing that. Yeah. allows me to get way more done and just be more chill. Like, you know, I personally can't track the news. I think that what's going on in the world is largely beyond my control. I vote when the time comes around in a kind of antagonistic way. I know who I don't want to get into those positions, and I'm happy to vote for that person that is not that. But other than that, I don't trip on it. It's like, you know, re- read the decline and fall of the Roman Empire if you think we got it bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, Aiden, I think this has been a great chat. I really appreciate you hanging out for as long as you did. Please do tell people where they can find Six Ways, your latest book, and where they can keep up with you across the internet if they're interested. Uh, I'm really easy. If you do a search for Aiden Walker, you will find everything. I'm on Facebook, Instagram. My website is AidenWalker.com. Uh, Six Ways at the moment is uh, available only through online sources, but actually by the time that this comes out, I will be uh, able to uh, hook up bookstores, physical bookstores with copies if they're interested. Uh, and they can also uh, contact me just at Aiden at Red Temple Press. And uh, we can set that up for them. Definitely. Yeah. And Six Ways is a, I think, is a great foundational text for anyone that's interested in magic or sorcery. So again, thank you so much for being here. Well, yeah. thank you for having me. All right. Well, take care of yourself, man. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, Ryan. And there you have it. My thanks again to Aiden Wachter. Really enjoyed that chat. Really vibed with his approach to magic. Again, not a practitioner myself. So what the fuck does my opinion matter? But the whole not taking the guided tour because it'll only take you so far, I dig that approach. I've never been a fan of groups myself, just doesn't fit my personality, and I think Aiden, uh, who has been involved with some groups, I think his view on this is a sound one, especially when it comes to spirit work. I mean, I have to wonder, you know, just how many spirits are there? And, and here we have systems of magic that only work with, you know, comparatively speaking, a select few of them. Like Aiden said, he thinks everyone who works magic has a group of spirit allies around them. An interesting point to consider. And maybe that's why you only hear or read about a select group of spirits. Maybe those spirits are, say, allies of elite aristocratic families. And working magic with them only continues to aid them. You may be in touch with spirit allies, but are you in touch with your spirit allies? And I could be completely misinterpreting that, but either way, it's just magical food for magical thought. And so is that whole, you know, getting eaten by your dog after you die thing. An interesting angle on death in the food chain that I also kind of vibe with now. And one more thing about this chat. That whole getting clear bit and not overworking yourself, allowing yourself to find that sweet spot where you want to be in your own life. I saw something recently that I think is a good roadmap to that. And it has nothing to do with magic or meditation or even art or creativity. It's just some simple things that you can schedule into your day-to-day life that will simply make it more enjoyable. And I'd like to share that list with you right now. This is a monthly checklist of things to do. The first thing, one lunch date with a friend. One 24-hour period with no social media. One full day outdoors. One night out with friends. One date night, even if it's just with yourself. One breakfast meetup with friends. One movie night one day serving others, and one day completely to yourself. And a lot of these could be accomplished all in the same day, if you planned it out well enough. So some practical, non-magical advice there. And this is something I've been doing more of recently myself, and man, do I feel so much more, I mean, not just clear, but so much more like myself. Anyway, if you missed the Patreon extension, we built on that last bit there about being clean and clear and talked about how to get more into a trance state, if you're into that sort of thing. We talked about finding your magical voice and your magical aesthetic, the concept of sacred fear or holy fear, which Aiden calls a type of information. Pretty cool stuff there. We also talked about what I thought was the best bit in the book, Aiden's advice on reclaiming yourself and your power. And the last thing we did was throw out some names for our punk bands, if we had one. Good times all around. 
Of course, you can hear that extension by signing up for the Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash oculture. A plethora of people did that last week while I was away, so that was a pleasant surprise. My thanks to Chloe, Jordan, Julie, and Jonathan. An extra special thanks to Caleb, James, and VH Freighter RC's Hermetic Study Group, who became official executive producers of the show. Thanks to all of you for joining the esoteric endeavor. And thanks to all you out there listening for your support. Dollars, downloads, or dropping reviews on iTunes, whatever you can do to support the show and spread the love is much appreciated. In fact, a couple five-star reviews recently came in that I completely missed, but wanted to share real quick. First, Peyton503 says, Smart, interesting, and level-minded. I am a writer who listens to Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, and other big think shows. This is a good addition to get less popular but equally important ideas. Keep on! Exclamation point. Thanks, Peyton. I will definitely keep on, and you keep writing. We need more of those kind of folks for sure. And another five-star review from Kodile Focus. Hope I'm saying that right. Who writes, Kool-Aid worth drinking. Pleasing intro music? Check. Knowledgeable host? Check. Amazing guests? Check. Open and concise discourse? Check. Complete lack of arrogance? Check. Looks like I have another great addition to my pod quiver. Thanks for your insights and information. Praying hands emoji, or whatever you'd call it. So yeah, thanks again to Peyton and Kadao Focus for their five-star reviews. Feel free to leave one of your own. We need more kind words to share with each other, methinks. And methinks my time this time is up. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. <laughs> Please rewind this cassette.